Do I have to motion or can we can yeah. yeah, so. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right, I'll call to order the meeting, the public session of the, um, of the meeting, and uh, welcome everyone. Happy homecoming week. Um, I'm sorry we're meeting during the field hockey game. I don't know if we have any updates on the score, but hopefully we'll be, we might be able to be efficient and catch the end here. But um, it's a great week, a lot of fun tradition. Um, I hope everyone's having a chance to enjoy um, all the activities. Um, also a reminder about our centennial celebrations this weekend. Um, we've got some fun events planned with the speaker panel, the tours, the photo exhibit, the Bronco TV, the alma mater, um, on and on. Um, I think there's a link at our website with more information on what's available. Um, we're sorry that Dr. Montesano can't be with us tonight. He's uh, on the mend under the weather. We r wish him a very speedy recovery. Um, Roy, if you're out there watching, we're glad that our incoming interim could step in. Um, thank you, Rachel. And a quick update on some of the board priorities we've been talking about. Uh, we are ready to go out to the community with a, a survey on um, our board communications. We're trying to communicate uh, better and more often, and we want to hear from the community how we can continue to improve, so please look for that shortly. Um, uh, another shout out for the curriculum timelines, a tremendous amount of work went into those by Mara and her team. Um, I know they're going to take us all a long time to get through because there's so much information there, but if you haven't already, please do take a look. Um, I really do believe it's a it, I, I've looked at a lot of websites and what they put up for curriculum timelines, and I do think it's an example of leadership on the part of our district to have that kind of information available so easily. Um, and also coming up, we've got some long-term budget planning sessions. Uh, we're going to start at our regular time for the October session, and then we're going to start a little earlier than originally scheduled in November so that we can have some time for um, some strategic, to, to discuss some strategic questions about the budget and how we might plan earlier for, um, and, and more strategically going forward. So with that, we have plenty of business to get to, and I think the next item on the agenda is the um, approval of the membership of the uh, Safety and Health Committee. This is a committee we're required by New York State to have. Um, I had the good fortune to serve on it years and years ago when I was pretty new to Bronxville, and it's an amazing collection of administrators and parents and members of law enforcement and uh, board members. So it's a, a very interesting cross-section of people who come together to uh, focus on the health and safety of our school community. Um, um, one of the things that, so thank you to everyone, and there's probably many committee members in this room right now. Um, I think, Michael, you're going to be our board rep. So thank you in advance for your service on that committee. Um, one of the things the committee will be um, uh, taking up, or uh, I hope will take up, is we want to continue to um, to explore and um, revive our very valued relationship with the police department. The police department has historically been very present in our school. We've had office space for them. They are um, they do many walkthroughs of the building, um, and of course we have the good fortune of them being right across the street. So um, the office space um, went away during COVID, but we, if we haven't already, I know we hope to bring that back, and I just want to emphasize how valued that relationship is and that the safety committee will be spending a little bit more time um, discussing how to continue to strengthen that relationship. So um, we need a vote on the members of the safety committee. Um,
be a resolve the Board of Ed of the Bronxville Free Union School District approves the membership for the 22-23 District-wide Safety and Health Committee. Um, may I have a motion to approve those that membership? Motion. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, next on our agenda, we have an update on the superintendent search. Since our last meeting, our search consultants held uh, interviews with uh, each individual board member um, to kind of do a refresh on priorities for our, our next superintendent. Um, as a result, they made a few tweaks to our specs, um, which if we scroll down, if we're able to scroll down a little bit, are up on the screen. There we go. So the two tweaks to the specs that we developed in the spring are the addition of um, facilities, which makes a lot of sense. We spend a lot of time making sure our facilities are in good shape. And then we've also added the word balanced so we're looking for a centered and balanced objective thinker. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to comment on um, on the meaning, what, what we intend for the meaning of balanced in the specs. Uh, I, think, I think what it means is we're looking for somebody that's going to steer the ship down the middle with all of the noise around the country coming from different directions politically, we want somebody who is going to remain neutral and centered and balanced and make sure that Bronxville continues going in that direction. Okay. Um, so those are the specs in the, in the advert, this is, becomes part of our advertisement in the search and um, Two other little items in this advertisement to consider. Um, we have our ad formerly said one of the nation's most highly regarded and progressive public school systems. As we talked about at the last board meeting, while um, progressive is a word that has historically been used to describe our district for many, many years, and the Lighthouse School book about our our district makes use of that word. And I think in all of the best senses of that word, we are a progressive school district. It's also a word that has a lot of baggage these days. And so um, uh, we've, we've replaced that word with innovative, um, meaning to capture kind of the best um, sense of the word progressive. And um, so I think we are voting on the ad and the specs separately. Okay. Um, the only other um, item related to the ad and the specs was we've had some discussion because we have a desire to make sure we capture candidates who might be interested in our um, in our opportunity nationally, we talked about where we might advertise the position. Um, traditionally, uh, it's our understanding from our consultants that, um, that candidates tend to look at more specialized industry, online and print publications. Um, we talked a little bit about whether it made sense to advertise in the New York Times after some further um, sharing of information, I think we're not sure that's a cost-effective place to advertise. So we're gonna forego the New York Times advertisement and stick with, as advised by our consultants, the more traditional industry-focused places to advertise the search. So with that, is there, any more discussion that anybody wants to have on the specs, on the advertisement? I think you just want to reinforce the timetable. Yeah. I mean, just for everyone's edification, knowing that we, do you want to review that at all or just? 
Yeah, I mean, I don't have a detailed timetable to share, but in general, because we had some momentum with the search last spring, we want to make sure we capitalize on that. There are other searches going on at this time in Scarsdale and I can't remember where else, Sa North Salem? North Salem. Yeah. Um, so we want, if possible, to kind of be out ahead of these other searches. So. Our timetable is a rolling one. Um, following this meeting, we'll, we'll, that advertisement will be placed. And um, our search consultants will begin recruiting. So we hope to be ready to hear from the search consultants on recommended semifinalists sometime in November, which is a little earlier than a traditional search timeline, which would have us recruiting um, through December and into January. Uh, and then if we have candidates that we want to see, that will happen first weekend of December. We will also see some candidates um, that we met in the spring who we've continued to have dialogue with. And if we feel it's necessary, if depending on what kind of a pool that we see, um, we're going to leave the search open until mid-January so that if there are other candidates that emerge on the more traditional timeline, which has, as we understand it, which has candidates tending to really focus on these opportunities more in December and January, then we'll still have that option. Anything else? All right, uh, so we're going to, we're voting to approve the revised specs and the new advertisement. Um, do we have a motion to approve those two items? Thanks, Pete. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh, I don't know. Let me text him. Yeah, motion carries. And I think we're moving on to minutes. I'm just going to uh, confirm with Michael, assuming he can't make it. Okay. Uh, I think our last item of business before um, before Rachel gets started is approval of the minutes from September 1 and the special meeting from August 30th. Any changes to those minutes, questions, comments? Motion to approve? Motion. Second? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Good evening, everybody. Um, just to build on uh, what Susan was sharing, this has been a very exciting week in the school as we lead toward um, Saturday's homecoming and uh, the official celebration of our centennial. Um, our festivities this week will culminate tomorrow with a pep rally in the high school where we'll be launching the singing of our school alma mater be the light, and that is in honor of our centennial. On Saturday, as you mentioned, we have our homecoming with a number of not only athletic events, but centennial celebrations. Please go online and register for those if you haven't. Uh, there are tours in the building, as well as uh, beautiful historic photos that are throughout our new atrium. And I just want to send a shout out to the Centennial Committee that's been meeting really since last year um, and have done an extraordinary job uh, planning Saturday. Um, in addition, William Q. Dowling has donated a painting um, that he commissioned and it is prominently displayed in our auditorium lobby 
of the um, front of our building. It's really just beautiful. So please um, make a point to, to go up there and see that as well. Um, and then our elementary school has been honored with the 2022 National Blue Ribbon Award. Um, this is through the U.S. Department of Education, and they created this Blue Ribbon Award to recognize schools that are considered outstanding. Our elementary school will be honored at an awards ceremony in early November down in Washington, D.C., and Roy and I and Rakia and Joe Makora are very pleased and honored to attend that. I want to just thank um, the two prior principals who have helped um, this school in extraordinary ways, and that's Trisha Murray and Joe Makora, and um, as well as Mara Ketke, who helped um, submit that application. And of course, to all the elementary school teachers who cam come to school each and every day with their A game and they continue to do so well by our students. So congratulations to the entire elementary school. Good. Okay, so we'll move on to the enrollment. Diana? Yeah, yeah, great. So this is typically the board meeting where we would review our enrollment data for the current school year. Um, so you see before you a breakdown by grade level. Um, I just want to also note, in addition to these numbers, it does include um, in the elementary school 40 new students, um, in the middle school 23 new students, and 16 in our high school. Um, so our enrollment at this moment is 1,574 students. And then we have a breakdown for you in terms of by school, just to give you a little bit more detail. Here in the elementary school, you can see um, the number of students in each sections. For those of you that remember, we were at six sections at every grade level. And given the incoming enrollment each year, we were able to decrease that to five. Just this year in third grade, we went back up to a sixth section because that was warranted based on the enrollment. And we were able then to keep the third grade numbers um, in the low 20s, 2021. Um, fifth grade also has six sections. For those of you who are familiar with our structure in sixth grade, it is a team teaching model. So we are hoping to be able to keep that at six sections as long as it's viable, given the numbers. Next year's number should be similar to this year, so we're hoping six sections can be maintained there. In middle school, Joe structured this a little differently like um, Ann does in the high school, just to give you an idea of the breakdown of class sizes um, as it relates to both subject areas, and we break it down in terms of a range. Um, we keep an eye, obviously, on, that, on those two last columns. We don't want our sections getting too big. Um, the only sections that are 30 and above is in the performing arts. And that's by design. Yes. Yeah, those are like the core. We want a lot of people in yeah. there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then in high school, same breakdown. You'll see similar percentages this year to um, prior years. Again, our largest sections are in performing arts. Any questions on any of these? So we've seen, it sounds like, historically, um, small drops in overall enrollment. And this year, for the first time in a while, if I'm understanding correctly, we're seeing a small uptick. Mm -hmm. it's just It's just one percent, but nonetheless, an uptick. That's right. Um, so, uh, I'm trying to understand it's people moving in the town, other reasons, fewer kids going to private schools. Um, I think our private school numbers have been pretty stable, so okay. I don't think um, that's what it is. I yeah. do think we may be seeing some families who no longer have children in the district moving out, yeah. and then these new families moving in have school-aged children. 
That's great. Um, it's wonderful. It has implications for our budget. That's right. And you know, the principals do a really good job about you know keeping an eye on the number of sections needed based on enrollment and looking ahead two, three years based on at least what we know in the moment. Yeah, got it. Any other questions on that? Also in our September board meeting, we typically have our achievement profile. Um, and that includes our th third through eighth grade New York State tests, as well as our regents exams, our AP exams, and that leads us, of course, to college matriculation. Um, New York State Education Department initially embargoes the New York State test results. And just today at about four o'clock, um, that embargo was lifted and Dr. Kecki was ready to go. So um, I hand it over to Mara. Don't hesitate to ask any questions as she's presenting. And we do have our principals here as well. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here tonight uh, to provide the achievement report for the 2021-2022 school year. Uh, as Dr. Kelly mentioned, this will include data that begins with our third graders and, and ends with our graduating seniors who are pictured there. The 2022, and we can get a good sense of where we are in the system in terms of achievement and the kind of data we look at and how we know we are continuing to prepare our students for their next step. proficient, which means they were scoring at a level three or a level four. 
as compared to 85% of students when this test was given in 2019. So what this slide sh shows us is that sort of where we were historically pre-COVID, we, we're right back in, right? And in some cases, we've actually gained something here or there. Um, I would be remiss to say, um, to not say anything about the grade five 2019 assessment. While that looks really good on the screen, we went from a 67% proficiency rating to an 81% proficiency rating. If you watch me on YouTube give this presentation in 2019, scores on the fifth grade ELA were down in Bronxville, across the state, and across Westchester. So the thinking was that the test was not really well constructed because that number stuck out all across the state at, as well as here. But I think what this shows you is in our elementary school, um, you know, we're kind of recouping where we were historically. During COVID, you know, we were most worried about our youngest readers, right? That was who I think we were most concerned about in terms of ELA. And the students in third grade uh, who were test here, we're actually in kindergarten in the year 2020. So I think it's quite impressive to say that kids who are in kindergarten in the year 2020 are now 94% of them are considered proficient in ELA. So this is good information. Moving on to middle school. This year, 90% of our sixth graders were proficient in math. 81% uh, of our seventh graders were proficient in math. Um, and 40% of our eighth graders were proficient in math. But I have to clarify something about those numbers. So as we're going to discuss a little later, most eighth graders participated in the open enrollment for algebra. So they do not take the grade eight math. In fact, this number represents only 29 students who were tested. But I will tell you that 11 of the 29 students actually reached proficiency level. So to say that 40% of the class of 29 are moving on as proficient students in math, I think is impressive, even though the bar would potentially tell another story. Um, this is, I think, where we are also focused on, on just making sure. I think during COVID, we were worried with some of the cumulative nature of mathematics. Um, it looks like our sixth graders have done very well. They would have been fourth graders. Uh, the seventh graders did well as well, but we, we're going to continue to watch this data just to make sure that all the math that they need, they have caught up on and all the skills that, that might have been, you know, um, affected due to stops and starts and all the things that happened over the last two years, we, we continue to monitor that performative assessment. But again, I think this speaks to the fact that we are returning as a system to where we were prior to COVID. Ma, Ma yes. sorry, I'm not sure I understand. For First of all, for grade eight, was the test not given in 2019? It was, but in 2019, all of the students in grade eight took it 
So I would have been showing you a bar oh. that was like 85 to 40, and it just wouldn't have been fair yeah, to compare it because we have okay. 29 testers, and how many eighth graders do we have approximately? 115 testers. So are we saying that all the 29 eighth graders then were, they didn't take the test? Does that mean they were moving on to high school math? I'm not sure I am following you. 29 students were enrolled in eighth grade math. And the rest of them were taking high school math. They were taking high school okay. math. They were taking algebra. Okay. And I have a whole bunch of slides on how those kids did. Okay. So does that mean, Mara, just so I get my head around it, that the 29 who are taking high school math? No, um, 29 took eighth grade math. Sorry, uh, 29. 101 took algebra one, which is considered high school math. Right. The 29 who took eighth grade math, did, a lot of them didn't quite meet the proficiency standards. 60% of them did not, 40% of them did. Got it, okay. That's a large number. I get, I'm, I'm impressed by the fact that what sounds like two thirds of our students went on to take um, high school math. But I'm a little concerned about the, the, you know, the call it one third that didn't and only half of them scored at a proficient level. So we have processes in place for those kids. Some of yeah. them may, in fact, have IEPs and get additional support in order to, you know, work towards proficiency. Right. Um, you know, we have levels of intervention that we give them. So those students do get our attention. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all students in any of these bars, you know, where you're looking at the 10% in grade six who are not proficient are getting support to try to make gains towards proficiency. I get it, I get it. Okay. So another way to kind of think about, did you say there were 150 eighth graders in total? There were 101, I believe. I know there were 101 in algebra and 29 in math eights. Well, if you, if you take the proficient 29 um, to the makers, and divide that by all of the eighth graders, you're up at like 85% proficiency. That's right. That's another way to look at it. <laughs> yeah. I like that one. So that right. feels a lot better than 40%. <laughs> but, right. But technically they did not take the exam. Yes, I understand. Right. But so I, presumably they're proficient. Correct. Yeah. Right. You're going to see just how proficient. Okay. <laughs> Got it. Un understood. <laughs> data that I sort of like to look at and every year we add a column so at some point we're going to have to take some off but you know this represents so we average all the three through eight testers in ELA and we come up with a number so we take all the kids that took the test which is a large majority of students here I mean some schools have tremendous amount of opt-outs we don't have any of that all of our families really participate uh, and you can look at the system if across years, how many were getting over, above the line, more or less, to levels of proficiency. So that slide shows that in 2013, we actually only had 69% of our third grade graders proficient in ELA, uh, compared to 31% who were not proficient. And when you go all the way over to 2022, 20, we're now at 90%. So you can see growth across the system here over the years in terms of students we were able to get over the line. And I would just point out that 2014 was the year we began the Teachers College Reading and Writing Project curriculum. That is a vertically aligned curriculum, meaning what is done in third grade uh, builds on what is done in second grade. It is you know, longitudinally uh, aligned and, and vertically aligned. And I think you can see some of the effects of this on the system. Mara, um, just a quick question. So this is great data, and I, I love looking at this as an impressive progress. But have you ever looked at it also against our peers or against other districts? So seeing this, I'm just wondering, are, are other districts, uh, you know, with 89, 11, and 2022, or where making this kind of progress that you've made? So I have done that in the past, um, where I would take one year's data mm -hmm. and look at some peer scores and I won't identify it by name but I'll have like a line that'll sure. show you where we score comparatively. Right. Um, I was really unable 
to do that because the embargo data was just released at four o'clock. Okay. So I would I only had access to my data in order to no, our data. It's great. No, I, and I'm not. Uh, it's not okay. deficient anyway. It's just it's interesting to me to see also how are our peers faring yes. um, along this timeline, and it gives us a sense of perspective and framework. That's all. Yes. So but, we, yeah. we do do that. I mean, we look at Scarsdale, we look right. at Chappaquel. After all of the data is released, okay. we have access to theirs as well. That's great. Thanks. Mara, quick question. Yeah. You came in 2015, right? I think 14. So you're doing a great job on this. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe 13. <laughs> Very true. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, math. Here we go. Another one. So here in 2013, you can see we were at 60% proficient as compared to 40% not proficient, and now we're at 90-10. So we're proud of this, and I want to thank all the teachers in middle and elementary school who teach ELA and math. Uh, for making these efforts to get more of, our, more of our kids over the line. It's very impressive, and it makes a difference in the lives of children. Okay, now we're going to talk about the eighth graders who took algebra. So I wanted to sort of point out a little bit of data in terms of what this program looked like when it was tracked meaning you had to be recommended by a teacher in order to participate compared to what it looked like when it was open enrollment. Uh, and, you know, that's a very big shift. You know, in our algebra class now for eighth graders, you, you are, the teachers will make a recommendation to the family, but the family can override the recommendation and decide they want to participate in algebra. And I would also note that 2018 was the first time we even offered algebra in eighth grade, which I think would be surprising to a lot of people. Um, so when it was tracked the first year we had it, we had 69 students enrolled in Algebra 1 as eighth graders, and the average region score was a 92. In 2019, 2020, we had 65 students enrolled, again, no regions that year of COVID. And tracked in 1920 as well? Tracked. Okay. Track again in 2020-2021, 67 students enrolled in the algebra class by recommendation with a 90 average region score. 2021-2022, 101 algebra students in eighth grade and the average region score was an 88, a drop of only two percentage points. And that's open enrollment. That's open enrollment. So you right. see our numbers went from 67 to 101. Now, I, I do want to say something about that. That means that 101 eighth graders are eligible, not to say that they will, but are eligible to take an advanced placement calculus class as a senior, if they so choose, <laughs> and continue to do well in accelerated math. That would have been compared to mid-60 number of students only eligible. So in terms of offering access, you know, being equitable and giving everybody a chance who wants to try algebra the opportunity to try it, I think this is great information for the district. We're really proud of this. And again, to say thank you to the algebra teachers who went along with the plan uh, and allowed any student who wanted to take algebra take it. And I think those numbers speak uh, to their efforts and speak to the fact that that is the right thing to do. Mara, I wholly expected, I hadn't seen these numbers before um, today, but I wholly expected that the, on the right far blue bar would have been the 65, 70 range. That's right. So well done. I mean, that, that is um, not what I, I, mean, I had spoken to a number of parents who were very concerned that we weren't going to have um, that be in the 80s. So this is great, yeah. in my opinion. It shows I did as well, and I think yeah. people were concerned about the rigor of the algebra class. I don't see um, you know, a lot of evidence that there would have been less rigor by opening the enrollment. I know the teachers kept the pace of the course as they normally would. Right. And I think it speaks to the fact that some kids really will rise to the occasion, and I will tell you, 
it was heartbreaking for certain kids when they were not allowed to take algebra as eighth graders because right. they, they knew what it might mean. And at that moment in time, they identified as not good math students and maybe not even good math students. So there's a lot of heart around this too, uh, that we gave kids an opportunity to feel good about themselves as math students. And I think that's gonna affect data in the high school. Yeah, another way to look at it is a year in the life of, a, of an 11 year old is a, is a, is a um, big part of their life. It's a lot, it's a, a lot of gains can be made in a year and they may bloom in seventh grade instead of sixth or eighth instead of seventh. And I think the point simply is that we're giving them some access here. Okay, uh, I also wanted you to just take a look at the algebra regents in terms of how they did uh, based on levels. So common core algebra regents, any regents, by the way, that is identified as common core regents, you can score a level one through a level five. If it is not identified as common core, it's only one through four, okay? So algebra is a common core aligned regents you can score a level one through five. So what you're looking at here is the eighth graders who took it last year, 64% of them scored a level five. And 34% of them scored a level four. So they did well. The blue bars represent the students who take it in ninth and 10th grade. And again, 49% scored at a level five, 30% scored at a level four. Um, but anything three or above is considered passing. So they did do well. And within the students who take it in even ninth and 10th grade, you had um, close to 80% of them scoring at the highest two levels. So I think this also speak, speaks to the strength of our math program. So talking more about common core aligned um, regents, this is another common core aligned regents that all of our 11th grade students take. And you can score a level five, a level four, or a level three. So this is showing you that last year, 85% of the students, juniors, who took the common core regents scored at the highest level with 9% scoring at the second highest level and 6% scoring at a level three. There's a lot of writing on this exam as well. So when you look at it, I think you have to consider that they, they write literary essays and, and there's a lot of writing here in that and they do very well on this measure. Okay, we got a little bit of a mixed bag on this slide. I'm gonna do my best to describe it, but Ann Meyer will help me out if I can't. <laughs> um, but let's just start on the right. So this, this global history regents is a new one. It's newly aligned to common core. So this is one where you could get a level five. All the rest are only levels one through four. So when you don't see the bright green on those other regions, it's not because no one got a level five, it's because the highest score you can get is a level four. Um, many, you know, all the kids did take the global regions. This was actually a newer test, one of the first times it was ever given. Uh, we did do well, 53% at the level five, 26% at the level four, which is the majority of the kids. But anytime there's a new assessment, there's sort of this, you know, this thing that happens where you're sort of, you're told about the assessment and you're trying your best to align the curriculum to it and make sure you're d getting the kids the skills and the content that they need. But once you actually see it, <laughs> then you kind of go through a curriculum revision and you could get closer to that. Otherwise, you're just trying to read from the standards, which is sometimes difficult, exactly how this is gonna be measured. So those numbers are great. I think they will get better now that we're more familiar with what the assessment will look like. Um, and if you recall, I may have presented this before. This is where students look at five or six historical documents. 
They have to identify the endur enduring issue of history represented in those documents, write an essay about how they have changed over time, and then bring in even some outside information they may ha have to try and discuss whether appropriate change has been made based, based on this enduring issue of history or not. So this is, this is a high level, uh, you know, the, the, the way they're assessing historical thinking now is much broader than kind of multiple choice content, do you know who so-and-so was? Um, so this, was a, this is a good test, and I expect now that we've seen it, we will, we will reconfigure the curriculum to make sure we're aligned there. What, what grade is that? Is that ninth, like if you're an AP world, Ten, student, 10th ten, grade, yeah. if you're an AP world, you'll take, this you'll take those regions as well? They take it, yes. So they have two years of world, and then they take it at the end of 10th. Great. Okay. So living environment is only out of levels one through four. As you can see, we had a lot of students at levels three and level four. Uh, typically, students are recommended uh, to take living environments if they're not going to take the core, which is chem physics, their first year. Um, so it's a good number of students. It's not all the students. Some who are in the core would not necessarily take this regents there. You do have to take one science regents in order to graduate. So you see that there are four offered, and you can see what percentage is scored in every level, one through four. The black line represents the number of students who took that, right? So you can see the physics was very few students took the physics, few more took earth, uh, some more took chem. Now, um, you, you know, you can take any one of these at any point. So if I'm a junior and I'm taking AP physics, I might just take the AP physics, uh, the physics regents to kind of knock that off right there. But it's kind of a mixed bag in terms of where these kids are going to fill that requirement in terms of passing a regents. Other than those ninth graders who are recommended to do living environments as opposed to the first year of core. How'd I do? Good. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the science people who take these regions, the curriculum they're in all year is not aligned with the regions exam. So my AP Physics 1 kids who are juniors, the AP Physics 1 is actually not what's on the physics regions, but those kids take that physics regions anyway and they fine. You just need to pass and graduate. Same with chemistry. So that's why the numbers aren't so much of measurement of the curriculum. The curriculum is not lined up It has nothing to do with their grade point, it's just pass fail. It, it does count as a final. Yep. It usually helps them. It's helpful when the former science teacher, current high school principal is in the <laughs> audience. Okay, we're going to move on to advanced placement, which is the college board curriculum. And, and just by way of kind of reference, uh, the AP College Board offers 36 courses, of which Bronxville currently offers 22. So let's talk about what we offer as compared to what the College Board offers. So in the arts, we offer 100% of the exams that the College Board, uh, courses and exams that the College Board offers. In English, also 100%. In math, also 100%, which includes computer science. Um, in science, 72% of those offered. There are only two that we don't offer. They are physics C. I believe one is in magnetism and the other is in electricity. Um, nice. And those are, right? It's, it's <laughs> unbelievable what you can learn when you have to do this presentation. Um, and those are physics based, those are calculus based physics courses. They're very high level. We have had students who can work at that level before. Um, they often engage in independent study with our physics teachers, but we of course offer AP Physics 1 and AP Physics 2. Um, in history, we actually offer 44% of the um, 
advanced placement courses offered. Ones that we don't offer include comparative government and politics, European history, human geography, psychology, and U.S. government politics. Now, we do offer a psychology course and a poli-sci poli course as electives. They are not advanced placement courses. Um, so that was interesting to kind of uh, look through. In world languages, we offer only 38% of the courses that, that are offered by the college board and the AP exams. Uh, but of course, in French, Spanish, and Latin, we offer the AP. We don't offer German, Italian, or Japanese. Uh, we do have a Chinese class in our high school. It is fairly under-enrolled, a Mandarin class, and none of those students would yet be at AP level. So that's why that number is so low. I think it's also fair to point out here that when you are in an AP class, you must take the exam. It is not optional. I don't know if everyone in the community realizes that. Um, you must take the exam. Okay. So now we're going to look at some numbers about five years historically. An AP student is any student taking one or more exam. So if I take five and Dan takes one, we both count. <laughs> I was going to do the reverse, but then I switched it. <laughs> we both count in that number, okay? No offense. <laughs> <laughs> so what you can see here is we sort of hover around similar numbers, right? Like for th three years there, we had 318. We had a little uptick, not much in 2021. Um, but if you look at the number of exams we offer, you know, we've gotten from like 711 over to 803, which means we, the kids are taking more exams and more courses. Now, there's good and bad problems there. It's good because we're give, giving more kids access to advanced placement courses. But I don't know if, if people are aware, you know, when I was in high school, this was largely juniors and seniors who took advanced placement courses. Now you have sophomores, you know, who are wanted taking two and even three advanced placement courses. So um, it's sort of the pressure to do these kinds of things begins earlier, which is why you see kind of a flat number of students, but more exams. Okay, AP students with scores three or better. So going back to, you know, if I take one AP and I get a five, I count in this number. If Dan takes four APs and he gets one three and the rest ones, he still counts in the number, right? So all you have to do is get a three in any one of the AP um, exams that you take. And you can see here we were at 285 this year. Um, you know, and that's a nice number. The bottom is only that reflected in percentage points, that same number reflected in percentage points. Now, I do want to say something about that. So in 2020, that's a high number, 92%. But it's important to point out that content was significantly cut by the College Board due to COVID. So what was sometimes a three-hour exam was a 40-minute exam. Oh, it was ridiculous. It was ridiculous. Okay, so you can't really look at that number in the same way you look at the other number. In 2022, they sort of went back to what they normally do, right? And we were still kind of in hybrid. I think some of the exams were even, 2021 rather, I'm sorry. In 2021, they sort of went back to their original content and their original, uh, you know, length of exam. Some were even, I think, still at home, some in school. Um, so that number was significantly lower, um, you know, and you would think maybe that would make sense if you think about everything that was going on at that time. But if you look at 2018, you look at 2019, and then you look at 2022, right, and you kind of look away from 2020 and 2021 for the obvious reasons, we're you know, back in the game and in some cases beating pre-COVID numbers in terms of the percentages of our students uh, scoring three or better. 
Dr. Kotke, one question. Um, you mentioned that the AP students with scores of three plus is really AP students with at least one three. Mm -hmm. um, if we were to look at it as the number of threes against the number of exams, roughly what would that tell us? I'm curious. Because we get to 90% when we say at least one three. Well, we can look by test. Yep. The average score. Sure. Almost every course we offer, the average is above a three, and some the average score is above a four. Yeah. Oh, got so it. So that means majority, almost all students get a three or above. Got it. Not almost every exam we get. Amazing. And sure. the ones, to be honest, the big ones are two seventy seniors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't, they right, don't right, right. Care at that point for the exam won't count for them in college. Right. So. Right. Got it. I actually think of that as a better measure. Um, it, get, it, it It's more granular on how our students are doing in each of those exams. That's, and that's good to hear. The other thing we were thinking about is, you know, why is it 89? Like, why is it high? Right? And we did do, we did do some uh, changing to staff in terms of the AP is a very constricted, rigorous, fast-paced curriculum. And we did put some people in there who we thought could keep up with that tempo at a better rate. Uh, and, and that, I think, uh, influenced the numbers. Also, as Ann mentioned, you know, we do get some senior fatigue in there on occasion. Um, but in this case, our seniors, you know, did do very well. I think they were, you know, their teachers spoke to them about the fact that these scores represent their teaching and represent our community. Some of these kids are taking tests and they're, they're going to prom that night, right? So, uh, but it, it did look like this year's, last year's seniors did give it a good effort, which we think, you know, put that, put those numbers a little bit above where we see them. Okay. Uh, moving on from advanced placement, I just want to talk about PISA for schools a little bit. PISA is an international assessment. This is the one where you typically hear about how the United States is doing compared to other countries around the world. They offer a program where your school can give it to your students so you can compare yourself to the country and compare yourself to the world. Uh, we get, this test is given to 15-year-olds um, selected at random, so these are not we can't hand pick the kids who take the exam. Uh, any, any one of our students, we actually had 91 students take the exam, which was all of them, I think. And then they only count a max of 85 in their data to be statistically significant. But these, are, these represent all kids, not kids, you know, electing to be in advanced courses, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and you can see here that we are statistically significant than any of the scoring in the United States as well as the samples from across the world. Um, I actually will say that our PISA, that we, when we got on the phone with PISA, they talked about our reading scores as being one of the highest they had ever seen. Um, so the kids were doing well in reading, and I would add that these kids were exposed to the Teachers College Reading and Writing Project program in grade four. So this is another look at that, and basically in PISA, the top, you can score a level one through six. So the top levels are five and six, the intermediate levels are two, three, and four, and if you're below a two, you're considered you know, to be below the baseline. Um, the top bar represents us in reading and in math and in science. The middle bar represents the United States in reading, math, and science, and the final bar under each subject area is the international comparison. So, what I think is interesting about this is if you look at the red in reading, in our school, in reading, in math, and science, we're leaving very few kids behind. Now, we can work on getting more students to the top levels five and six in math. We can work at getting more uh, students at the top levels five and six in science. And actually, we're piloting some science assessments this year called orbit assessments 
in our middle school, which is sort of a phenomenon-based assessment, meaning you get a scenario that's represented by a picture or a graph, and you have to make inferences from that uh, based on your ability to, you know, inference scientifically. So those assessments align a little bit more with the kind of work you're, the kinds of ways our kids are assessed are being assessed here. So I see that as being helpful in moving that number. But I think it's, you know, we talk a lot about our very high achieving kids, but this also shows that we're not leaving many kids, you know, uh, below a level of proficiency that we, we can be, we can stand behind. And we know who those kids are and they're receiving support so we can close the gap. Okay, last two. So um, this is the college admissions for the class of 2022 uh, based on the Barron's Guide. And Barron's uh, comes up with these categories, most competitive, highly competitive, very competitive, competitive, and other, or sometimes referred to as non-ranked. Uh, they sort colleges into tiers based on selectivity as measured by SAT scores, high school GPA, and class rank, and acceptance rate. Schools in the example of the most ca competitive category are the Ivies, University of Chicago, Davidson, Hopkins, Panoma, Swarthmore, some examples. Very competitive, uh, Catholic, Fairfield, University of Georgia, some UC schools. Uh, competitive are the CUNY schools, Alabama, University of Hartford, High Point, Iona, and some SUNYs, right, to give you just a flavor of what kinds of schools come under these categories. So you can see here that 73% of our students last year were admitted to the most competitive um, and highly competitive was 15%. So the, these are that, the same numbers, 2022, across the top, same categories, and we're going to look historically from 2016 up. So as you can see here, you know, we're doing very well. Uh, and we continue to get a good number of students into most competitive and highly competitive uh, colleges. And, you know, we did have a really good year last year, uh, but we hover somewhere in the 60s, you know, mid-50s, and we keep looking at that in terms of where our kids are getting in and attending. Has, has Barron's, like, changed what they're definition of most competitive is mm -hmm. over this time period? It's a good question. Um, I don't believe they have. Uh, I don't know that I'd be able to find the rankings from 2016. Like it's just, uh, our results are just going through. Like I said, we have the different categories. Generally speaking, I would say if anything, there are more colleges moving into most competitive just in terms of like criteria, selectivity, things of that nature, but I, I actually think that this are, are rather, uh, safe. Yeah, if you look, uh, I put the same thing, and you could see those numbers at 20, 21 and 22, essentially the same if you add up most and highly. There's probably some crossover there, right? Yeah. More applicants might put them into a bump them up. Where would that adopt? So Schools might test optional, more kids apply, lowers your Sure. Yeah. It goes down and you go into sure. the higher categories. Yeah. But it's still very good numbers. I mean, oh, it's no numbers. question. Great numbers, yeah. So that's it. Uh, I just would be remiss if I didn't thank all the administrators and all the teachers and kids who are behind these numbers and the hard work that they do every day. I'm the one who gets to stand up here and you know, take some of the credit, but uh, this represents the hard work that is done every day across the district on behalf of the students here, and, and uh, it's impressive. We continue to watch it and think of ways to improve, um, but, you know, given the last few years that we had, uh, these are really welcome numbers. So thank you.
Thank you, Mara. Thank you. Thank you. Where are we? Me. Oh, yeah, right. Yes, Dr. Kelly, thank you. So before you this evening, there are a number of personnel agenda items. Uh, again, these are typical for this time of year. We have our middle school advisors. We have a number of overages. That's when we ask teachers to teach above and beyond their full-time equivalent. Um, and they are willing to do so. That helps us offer um, electives on the high school level, which obviously we all believe is very important that we can offer these electives, whether they be um, speech and debate, acting, directing, uh, philosophy, psychology, et cetera. So that is above and beyond very often um, the teacher's full caseload. Um, in addition, we do have before you a new teacher aid to consider, as well as um, some substitute teachers. Also, uh, the special other stipends are before you this evening, as well as a new maintenance worker and a new senior office assistant. Those were both openings that we had um, existed and that are budgeted for. We also have um, uh, a leave for you to consider for the purpose of childcare, and we also have a revision to our fall coaching roster. Um, we are very honored this evening to have here with us one of our new uh, coaches, uh, specifically for boys varsity basketball, Mr. Brian Pritchett. And we appreciate that he has joined us this evening. He comes to us uh, with tremendous experience from the Mount Vernon School District with their basketball um, uh, program. And we're honored uh, not only that he will be our varsity boys basketball coach, but that you joined us this evening. So thank you. Welcome. <laughs> So I'm asking the board to consider resolutions A through double G this evening. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Any questions before we vote? Can I have a motion to approve? Motion. Second? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank, Thank you. you, everybody. And do we, are we voting on the, um, Oh, you did, so this included the middle school advisory list, and, okay. Um, I just have one quick question. I know we already voted, but where, the, where there were a few items that said, like, no line in 22-23, it's just not a club we're running? That's exactly right. Okay. And that's because of lack of interest, or? Lack of interest and just balancing, because we wanted to add a few. Um, and so just in terms of budgetary constraints, we want to make sure that we are able to add um, new, and um, so we did pause a couple as a result. Okay. Thank you. My turn. Uh, the board is in receipt of the uh, financial report for the months of August and September. Um, Dean, we have a few new board members. Uh, this format was developed by a finance committee uh, over 10 years ago, probably about 2009 or so. Uh, the top right kind of rectangle there tracks um, budgetary spending and versus uh, appropriations. 
kind of over time over the last few years. The portion to the left uh, is expenditures and then revenues in the current year. And uh, the bottom right uh, is not updated yet. That would be uh, updated uh, when we get the uh, audit in from our auditors. But that will track uh, fund balance projected compared to where we come in in the prior year. Uh, obviously, it's very early. Um, through the summer months, we're on target with no anomalous occurrences. Uh, districts spend comparatively very little over the summer months as the cost of staffing and students really don't begin until uh, September. Uh, we'll have more clarity uh, projecting through the rest of the year once uh, all these staffing uh, approvals are absorbed and encumbered, which is usually probably the October, November financial report. Uh, however, on the revenue side, we're seeing some good news. Um, uh, we have clarity at this point on uh, special, uh, I'm sorry, regular ed tuition students. Uh, we know how many we have, as the board will see that in a later, uh, a, a, a later resolution. Uh, and also sales tax, you know, rising rates are, are going to be uh, beneficial to our revenues throughout the year. Over the last couple of years when, uh, when rates plummeted, our interest income was fairly non-existent. But now uh, we're going to start seeing some because we the way, the way our tax collection works is we get a big pile of money in uh, July and a big pile in January. And uh, we're able to put that to work, uh, you know, through the following months. And, um, you know, I'd be happy to entertain any questions. There's not much going on so far. I think we'll see more in the coming months. Um, I do have some financial action items. Um, I have three, Connie, I believe. Uh, a is non-resident students for the board to approve for the 2022-23 school year. We have 18 uh, students paying full tuition, three in the elementary school, three in the middle school, and 12 in the high school, and 27 children of faculty with four paying the faculty rate. Uh, all the others uh, were grandfathered in uh, prior to uh, when the uh, faculty rate was negotiated. Uh, financial action item B uh, is a special education service provider contract with cognitive behavior consultants for dialectical behavior therapy services uh, not to exceed $20,000. I have no idea what that means. Okay. Rachel might be able to help you with that. You pronounced it very well, however. Um, so these are consultants who come in and they work um, monthly with our school psychologists. Um, and that helps us deal with our uh, most fragile children who may be experiencing um, anxiety and or depression. And um, it is school-based. You know, these are children that are typically um, in treatment privately, but we want to make sure that they are as successful as possible in school as well. Um, we've also broadened some of the training to our special educators, our guidance counselors, just to ensure they're using the most effective pra practices and strategies um, to help support our students. And then uh, financial action item C is a contract with a service provider we've used in the past to provide uh, special education transition services uh, when needed. Colleen O'Sullivan is a transition specialist, and what we mean by transition, it's typically for our students who are eligible to stay in school until they're 21. They have individualized education plans, they are ungraded, um, and we want to help ensure that when they graduate um, from our Life Skills High School class, um, they are best prepared for their next steps. Yeah, I got one question on item number one. How, sure. This has come up over the summer with some parents in town, but how is the tuition rate determined? Uh, it's a formula determined by the state. Uh, it's based on uh, 
it, it's, it's loosely based on our per pupil spending, but with uh, certain special education transportation costs taken out of that formula. Thank you. Um, and is there any, um, what's the right word, is there any ability to impact or change that at the school level, or uh, is this wholly dictated by the state? It, it, it's dictated by the state. Okay. Facilities update. Oh, Motion to vote on those to approve those items. Motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Thanks, Dan. Uh, LAN, our consulting architects, are working on our five year facilities plan, uh, which will include something we've been dis some of the things we've been discussing in recent years, uh, you know possibly addressing locker rooms and a maintenance building out by the field and some upkeep and maintenance of high ticket items that are just, you know, kind of uh, coming due, such as uh, some roofing and uh, original D-wing uh, section brick and steel support work um, that, will prob that will be presented uh, probably before, uh, before December. Um, uh, one method to help address some of these items was, uh, you know, suggested by Dr. Montesano and members of the Finance Committee is to perhaps increase our limits on our construction reserve from uh, the current limits of about $10 million total with an annual uh, contribution limit of a million to something larger than that uh, to address some of these needs. Um, and that will, that will require uh, a referendum question. So that's something you know we'll talk about through the course of the budget process. They will kind of go hand in hand. And um, other than that, uh, we did have a couple of power outages uh, late last week, uh, which is new to us. We, we haven't had power go down in a couple of decades at least. Um, even uh, during some of the hurricanes that, uh, and floods that hit the area, the school was always in power. Um, but, uh, you know, it was a good test. There were some things we have to, to work on as far as some of our emergency procedures in a uh, power outage. So it was, uh, you know, a good test for us. So we're working on that. And it rectified some issues that have popped up. I do have uh, one facilities action item. Uh, it's actually a reconciliation of change orders with our electrical contractor, which is uh, really the final piece of our construction project. Um, uh, at the July Facilities Committee meeting, I estimated about $150,000 worth of change orders left with uh, Foremost Electric Corporation to complete the project. And uh, our architect and construction manager uh, we're still negotiating and, and successfully negotiated the cost of those change orders. Uh, the final change orders are in for approval of the board uh, and came in as projected. All the change orders, again, have been reviewed and negotiated at length by the architect and construction manager, and it's a, their recommendation that we approve them so we can close out the project. Uh, and with these change orders, the project comes in at about a half a million dollars under budget which uh, for a project of that size and the duration and the uh, issues we encountered along the way with the pandemic, uh, you know, is pretty good. And I think reflects uh, very well on facilities committee and finance committee work over the last four years. So with that, I would ask for approval of those change orders that were circulated uh, with the finance committee with no objections, or with the facilities committee with no objections last week. That's great, Dan. So you had estimated 150,000 in change orders. It looks like they came in at 128. It was still about 150 because we had some room left on allowances. The the original contract included a, an allowance of about fifty thousand dollars for change orders, and there was probably about twenty-eight thousand left on that. So okay. it came in right at about 150 all total, I think. Okay. But great. You know, I think it's a, a very successful project. I mean, uh, we got uh, a few to, uh, 
a few beautiful spaces out of it, you know, because the, actually the, uh, you know, the Innovation Center, the, uh, uh, the, the um, atrium, yeah, it, just beautiful spaces and a lot of infrastructure work done. In now, the, the building's 100 years old, so, you know, five years later now than when this original project was approved, there's going to be more infrastructure. You know, it's going to be a constant battle with a 100-year-old building. Um, and then we'll do some work on how to best finance that over, to, over you know, the next year or two. Yeah, I mean, well, it, it seemed, when I was reading the change orders, it seemed like we snuck in some, yeah. like, duct work to, make, to pave the way for air conditioning. Yeah. Which is nice. Yeah, and, and you know, we, we, when we do a project, uh, you know, change orders aren't just the failure to plan. We request things along the way to enhance space. If there's to enhance uh, our current um, our current facilities, if there's room, and so it's kind of a balance. If if we have room, that we can do things like that. Yeah. A very small deviation from financial plan, given the size of the project. Exactly. And so well done. And and the, the management from the architect and uh, more so the architect. And Construction manager, uh, the amount of change orders on this project compared to uh, uh, probably the, you know a few of the projects we've had in the past was very minor. Thanks, Dan. Any other questions? Motion to approve. Motion. Second. All in favor. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dan. It's my pleasure. I think we have another action item. Is that the Yes. Time? Spring baseball. Yeah, this is a fun one. Our kids are going to start to travel again, uh, which they haven't been able to do for two years. First up is the baseball team wants to go to Disney, and they just so happen to have a COVID credit that was about to expire for JetBlue. So, I have to confess, I told them to buy the tickets because if the board didn't approve it, their credit was going to expire anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I told them to go ahead and buy the tickets. Uh, but uh, they want to go to Disney from April 1 to April 6. And, uh, you know, it's great to see our students on the move again. This is probably the first of a few that the board's going to see this year. Okay. Yeah, that's great. So we're required to approve all trips. Um, any questions on that? that one and this is a, this, this trip is funded by the people going on the trip it's not funded by the uh, school district yeah I saw that and they have budgeted like a few fundraisers to help offset the cost sounds great all right if there's no questions uh, we need a motion second all in favor. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, looks like next on the agenda are committee reports, but I don't think we've really had too many committee meetings since the last meeting, so I don't know if anyone has any updates on committees or liaisons. Yeah, coming up will be an audit committee meeting before the audit gets presented by, to the board either in uh, early or late October, depending which meeting we can get the audit in. Okay. Uh, we already talked about the long-term planning meetings. The next regular meeting of the board is Thursday, October 20th. Um, I think that concludes our formal agenda. Um, Connie, before I forget, and we go into, we invite public comment, um, do we have the YouTube option to express comments available? Can we enable, is it possible to enable it? For the next meeting, so for this meeting, I wonder if anyone has a question, if they wanna email me um, which is S can F two N's I two F's or Connie yeah 
at bronxvilleschool.org. So please go ahead and send an email and we'll keep an eye on that. If anyone watching on YouTube has a question, then we can address it. Susan, can I say one thing about um, the PTA? Um, yeah, of course. The PTA liaison. Yep. And uh, it's been very uh, exciting working with them. They have a lot going on right now. They have a new website. They've got new means of communication. They've got an apparel sale going on. Lots of stuff for homecoming. So go spend some money, buy some shirts, <laughs> buy some hats, go to the events, um, and support the PTA. And I'll just add, I'm the uh, athletics liaison, and you know, we hired a new boys varsity basketball coach and girls varsity basketball coach. Um, on the boys side, uh, on both sides, you know, Joe Haven did an incredible job. He had parents involved. He had uh, uh, Mr. Lassane was there as school administrator. Uh, I know Dan was very involved looking at all the resumes for the boys coaches. Um, just a, a well done job by everyone involved. And Joe just uh, ran a great interview process. And I think we uh, got two dynamite coaches. Yeah, it sounds like it. I forgot one thing before Amy Krause texts me. Um, <laughs> buy tickets for the PTA events. There's one for each grade. Uh, I think fourth and fifth grade. We got to put some pressure on the parents. Um, a lot of them are sold out. So thank you for that. And uh, if you haven't bought a ticket yet for your kids' class, please do so. All right, so I think we're at the point where, and I do apologize, it, it, I should have remembered to remind all of us to enable that feature. We will en enable it for the next meeting. But in the meantime, again, if anyone watching has a question, please do email Connie or me. Um, and so now I think is a time where we open it up for any public comment or discussion. Is there anyone who would like to say something? All right, well, thank you all for coming. Thank you, everyone, for a very informative and productive meeting. Um, may I have a motion to adjourn? Motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Um, from Sandra B. Is there a website for PISA assessments for 2022? I don't see any PISA participation past 2018. Is there a website, I guess, where, sh where additional information can be accessed? For our school or about the program in general? It's only given every, and is it four years we give it? How many years do we give the PISA? Uh, so we do the 2012 Every four years, okay. Um, and if, if the question is not answered satisfactorily, we'll, um, Mara will, will provide it. Mara is only reported out by me. They won't find it on the website, but they can find sample questions and you know, information about the program. Okay, thank you. And I'll post a copy of the slide. On the, on the Great. Okay, thank you. Do we need to formally adjourn again? Okay, motion for that, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you.